Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. CBS News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Bill Harwood, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. How do you hear me? Hello, we have you loud and clear. Well, hey, thanks so much for taking time to talk with us today. I know you guys have hit the deck running and you've got a busy schedule, and, and we certainly do appreciate it. I wanted to start out by asking both of you about your impressions of launch aboard a Crew Dragon, Falcon 9. Jessica, you've never ridden a rocket before, of course. What was it like? What was the sound like, the vibration, the acceleration? the experience. Yeah, it is uh, tough to describe. It is certainly a, a sensory experience. Um, all of the, the feeling, the physical feelings that you're feeling, the sounds that you're hearing, as you mentioned. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of training um, out at uh, SpaceX in Hawthorne um, for um, what we are going to experience on Dragon. But getting all of that kind of coming together all at once um, and also, you know, kind of experiencing the emotional side as well, you know, realizing um, that we, we are really actually embarking on this journey and headed up to the International Space Station. So all that coming together was was uh, pretty amazing. You know, I, I occasionally amuse myself by thinking about how Ben Franklin or Leonardo da Vinci would react to riding in a car or flying in an airplane. Flying in a rocket it really takes that to a whole different level. Were you were you even a little bit nervous about it? I mean, was there a moment when you might have thought to yourself, what am I doing here? Yeah, you know, there certainly is a, a an understanding of, of what we're undertaking here. And and, and certainly space flight is hard. We all are, are aware of that. Uh, but we just have such amazing teams working on the ground, uh, both the SpaceX team, the NASA team, making sure that we are safe and that our mission is going to be successful. So we can certainly rest assured uh, knowing that we have such a great team of folks looking out for us. I totally get that, but you didn't answer the question. Did you get even a little bit nervous? Because I think most people would. Yeah, you know, again, I think there, there is certainly an understanding of the reality of the situation and the, the risks that are involved. But we are in a place of privilege where we are, are able to uh, talk about those risks, understand how they're mitigated, um, and that, that really helps us switch our fears. Oh, no, go ahead, Samantha. I, I just wanted to say that I, I think for us, and especially for Wadi and on her first flight, but even for me on my second one, the feeling of joy for having gotten to that point after so, such a long time of training and the anticipation for all this amazing adventure that awaits you on Space Station, I think that just, you know, takes over emotionally so that, yes, maybe you're a little bit nervous, but you don't focus on that all that much. Well, hey, as long as uh, you've got the microphone, I wanted to ask your impressions on Crew Dragon. Uh, you know, were there any surprises about that experience and, and maybe how it compared to riding on a Soyuz? Yeah, so the, the process of launching to space, uh, so the, the rocket launch itself, the sensations that you feel in the, um, in the rocket, uh, the duration of the ascent uh, up to orbital insertion, the Gs, um, the staging, you know, when, when one stage of the rocket stops working and all of a sudden you lose the thrust for a few seconds and then the next uh, stage kicks in, which is quite dynamic, and then that transition from, you know, feeling squeezed in your seat, uh, that, you know, very sudden transition to being all of a sudden weightless. Um, all of that is, is, is quite similar, and I was incredibly happy to have a chance to experience all of that again, um, maybe with more awareness, uh, um, maybe being less overwhelmed emotionally, and so having a little bit more time of really taking note of all of those sensations more than the first time. Um, and then certainly the spacecraft is, uh, as you know, as, as we all know, a little bit different, so certainly uh, a little bit more comfortable uh, in terms of, uh, of seating position. You know, we enjoyed that uh, photo you tweeted showing uh, the birthday cake and the shot of Mr. Spock in there. I said before launch that you may or may not have a replica costume from another science fiction show with you. Any hints when we might find out uh, what that might be? Let's see. A hint could be um, my previous job as a combat pilot in the Italian Air Force. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. So either Battlestar Galactica or Star Wars. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll have to wait and see. Um, let me ask Jessica a question. You know, we, we talked a lot uh, before launch about your, your geology training and a chance to look at the Earth from space. Um, you know, geologists normally look at rocks with a hand lens or a thin section up close and personal. What's it like looking at that from 260 miles up? And is Chell pestering you to explain things like he said he would? Yes, so the, the view is even even better than I could have imagined and could have expected it. Um, it is amazing to see, as you're kind of discussing, the, the scale um, of the Earth itself, of the, of the whole sphere, and then also of the features on the Earth. Uh, for, for me, I actually spent a lot of my time doing geology, also uh, doing remote sensing. And so that process involves looking at uh, photographs as well as, as data um, of surfaces of planets from, from a uh, distance removed away from the surface. So it actually is quite an interesting parallel for me to be able to now um, look at those features from the vantage point of the ISS. So um, it is it is really neat for me. And yes, it, <laughs> uh, my, my crewmates have, have given me the joy and honor of being able to discuss a little bit of geology already. So it's it's been super fun for me. Well, you know, you sound totally at ease up there when I hear you talking on air to ground. Has the transition to life and weightlessness been easy, difficult, something in between? It's been the biggest challenge for you, getting used to living on station. Yeah, you know, I think the, the probably the biggest thing to... Um, learn how to do since we've been up here as well as 
probably the most fun thing for me, um, has been getting used to the, the 3D nature of the ISS. Um, getting to literally climb on the walls like Spider-Man and learn how to use my feet uh, instead of my hands to translate around um, is has just been so fun. And just being able to see you know, how my brain reorients and really is able to take in spatial information in 3D. And that transition over time has been really cool to watch. Guys, i got about two minutes left. I want to shift gears. And, and Samantha, let me ask you this one. Uh, East is in the process of recruiting new astronauts. And I was wanted to get your sense of what the prospects are for increasing the number of female candidates. And, and how important is that for ESA and for Europe? Oh, I, I think the prospects are, are great. Uh, we had uh, over, I believe, 25% of the um, applications were for from uh, female candidates uh, this time around, which is a, a, you know, a significant increase compared to the previous selection process, which is the one in which I was selected. So I am... Uh, quite sure that by the end of this year I will have some uh, um, you know new colleagues and among them uh, also some uh, some new female colleagues and I, you know I, I think that's important because it, it, it just looks uh, um, you know if you look at the European astronaut core right now there's only you know one woman which is myself and and that kind of looks uh, it does really not reflect society that much so I'm looking forward to have some more uh, uh, female colleagues thanks and Jessica I'll close out with, with, with a similar question to you um, you're the first African-American woman to make a long-duration flight on the station. How important is it for NASA to recruit more women and more women of color? I mean, you must see yourself as a role model, but can you talk about that just a little bit, and that'll close it out for me, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your time. Uh I certainly think that it is, is important going into the exciting future ahead of us at NASA uh, that we have a diverse core and continue to focus on the diversity, the, the impacts of diversity um, on, a, on the greater team here at NASA. So as we look forward to the Artemis missions um, coming up here in the near future and look towards the moon and eventually to Mars, we're going to need people with diverse skill sets, diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse experiences. And so I certainly uh, think it's important for us to, to prioritize and, and focus on that moving forward. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the CBS News portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from CNN. Station, this is Rachel Crane with CNN. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. How is? Loud and clear. All right, I'll jump right in, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Jessica, you are the first black woman to conduct a long-duration mission on station, You know, making you a role model for women of color all around the world. Now, being a few days into your historic mission, has the magnitude of what you have taken on here finally begun to sink in? Yeah, you know, honestly, I think these past few days have been a bit of a, a whirlwind. Uh, we've just been, um, as a crew, trying to take in as much information as we could from our, our uh, colleagues, the Crew 3 uh, team, and uh, just handing over all of their knowledge and, and insight and efficiencies that they've gained over their time and successful mission here. So we've just been trying to learn as much as we can from them, soak it all in. And then I have just been learning to adapt, learning to translate in, in zero G and um, get myself settled in. So um, that's been most of my focus uh, the past few days. Jessica, this mission is your first space mission and a historic one at that. But clearly, you know, your personal aspirations don't stop here. So tell us about your you know, future dreams and goals as an astronaut. Yeah, well, certainly first and foremost, my, my closest dream and closest goal is to have a successful mission here with my crewmates on, on Crew 4 Expedition 67. Uh, we have a lot of science to undertake, a lot of uh, maintenance to do on the station, and uh, we just look forward to a super successful mission working together. Um, in the future, um, NASA is, is working towards um, heading to the moon and eventually to Mars um, with the Artemis programs. And so we look forward to uh, seeing the progress in those missions and, and hopefully being involved in that process along the way. Yeah, Jessica, you've been chosen to be part of the astronaut core for Artemis. So now having had, you know, just a taste of space, does it make you, you know, more eager than ever before to become the first woman on the moon? Well, I certainly uh, would like to you know, spend as much time in space as I, as I can. I've enjoyed it so far. Um, you know, but we definitely have a diverse and uh, uh, expert core of astronauts, all of whom would be capable of, of um, taking that on. So um, we'll see what happens in the future, but certainly enjoying my time here now. Now, Samantha and Jessica, only about 20% of the international space industry workforce is female. And that's a percentage that has remained relatively unchanged for 30 years. And only about 11% of astronauts have been women. So why are women so underrepresented in the space industry? And why is it important to change these statistics? Yeah, I, I think that some of those statistics can be a little bit misleading sometimes because we take into account like the entire history of uh, human space flight, which is now... Uh, you know, five or six decades. Uh, and so it, it reflects also a historic circumstances in which indeed, uh, you know, women were either not in the astronaut course at all or very few. Um, but I would say I am, uh, you know, the, the, especially the NASA core is extremely diverse. And the last few selections over the past 10 years um, have had new classes coming in in which uh, women were 
either 50% or very close to 50%. And uh, when it comes to the European Astronaut Corps, we, we have some work to do in that sense. But our last selection is it goes quite back to 2009, and we are in the process of having a new selection right now, in which uh, I am quite sure that we will select uh, several um, new female astronauts. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think uh, the things are, are looking quite good, I would say. And this question is for both of you. You know, as women, and for you, Jessica, as a woman of color, did you face barriers to get to this moment? And what is it like to reflect on that from your current perch up in space? Yeah, you know, it certainly is a, a an amazing place to be able to think back on on my journey and, and how we how I arrived here, how we ended up um, in this amazing place with this amazing privilege. And certainly for me, um, you know, I'm just super grateful for all of the mentors that I had along the way that helped encourage me to uh, along pathways that helped to lead me to to reach my goals and to um, help encourage me um, along the way to help find my passions, help me pursue those and help me find opportunities that would enable that for me. So I'm just really grateful for those people in my life and those those opportunities that I've had that have enabled me to be here now. Samantha, there is a war here on Earth right now with the U.S. and the EU supporting one side and Russia on the other. So how does that impact your working relationship with cosmonauts on station? And does the mood feel different from when you were there last? Yeah, the answer to your, the last part of your question is no. Uh, it's it's uh, it's quite the same. We are we are here as an international crew, and I think that we all understand that what we do here is valuable, that the space station is valuable, and that even in times of conflict, you have to preserve bridges you have to preserve some areas of cooperation and you know the best candidate for that is is just the space station i mean it's it has a legacy of of uh, working together on an international level and doing that peacefully and effectively you know being able to operate a, a vessel a spacecraft in space on a day-to-day -day basis with you know an international community behind it that is valuable and we just all understand how important that is and even more than we did before we want to focus on on on, on the joint goals that we have, which is to, you know, preserve this vessel and uh, pursue the, the science and all the other activities that are ongoing here. But do you worry that the Russian government could order their cosmonauts to take aggressive actions on station, you know, like closing off access to Russian modules or stop sharing resources? And if not, why not? Yeah, no, we, we do not worry about that. Uh, and, and the reason is that, you know, we, we, we have, I think, an instinctive understanding of the community that we are part of. And, and we understand that from our side, you know, the uh, U.S. side, European side, Canadian, Japanese and Russian, there is the same attachment and the same understanding of how important space station is. And I understand that there is sometimes chatter in the media or on, on social media, but we are inside this community and we have a direct understanding and a direct sense of how important space station is for all the international partners. Jessica, what would you tell your younger self right now about your journey? I would, I would probably tell myself to, to dream big and you never never know when your dreams can actually come true. Um, it's hard to believe that, that it's all really happening. And what do you think can be done to have more women and more women of color in space? You know, I think if we, we look at the numbers, um, I think the story that they tell us is that where we can have the most influence is um, kind of a lower down in the pipeline or earlier earlier in the pipeline. Um, so I think investing in um, school programs and education and um, internships, like the NASA internships, for example, the, um, particularly ones that I've been a part of and, and um, helped enable me to get here today. I think those are ways that we can engage kids at an early age to get interested in STEM, kind of invigorate that passion in them that allows them to pursue pathways that would, will enable them to be in positions like this um, if they so desire. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants from CBS News and CNN.